lived in Florida for 20 years, and I kind of miss hurricanes. <laughs> okay, well, not the fact that they always seem to come in the middle of the night and they sounded like a freight train in the dark, and not that we had to move every piece of outside furniture into our living room, and not that we lost electricity for usually 10 days because our area was one of the last to be restored. Or I guess not really that it was always hot and sticky. And definitely not that each year got a little worse. Maybe not those parts. But hurricanes brought out the best in every neighborhood I ever lived in in Florida. I remember that everyone knew I wasn't afraid of heights and was pretty good with roofing nails, a skill I learned living in Florida through hurricane seasons, so I was appointed the roof tarper. I loved that we'd figure out who had the biggest fridge and we'd all take our meat over there and find who had a generator and plug it in. Or if we had things that were ready to spoil, we'd have a big neighborhood grill fest to get rid of the food. Or that everyone checked on neighbor Jay because we knew that he was taking care of his wife with dementia. And if someone needed something, someone ran to find theirs. I miss that part. I live in a neighborhood where I hardly know my neighbors, and I attribute that greatly to the lack of hurricanes here. <laughs> it didn't matter who we loved, what race we were, or who we were voting for. Yes, hurricane season was usually in September or October when we were in the heat of election season and Florida was a swing state then. I remember because I recall bringing in our election signs and having them against the wall in the living room with all of our patio furniture. We're in an election season now and the anxiety is Hi. Anyone feeling it? And, and just me? No, it's, oh, it just must be me. No, it's, I can tell. I can tell that your anxiety is high because it's the first thing many of you are talking about when we meet as teams or small groups. I can tell that you're following closely because you often tell me whatever the news of the day is that day if I hadn't heard it yet. And I know that many of you feel passionately about your position. And I want to name clearly that we are not all on the same mind of this election. Our mission says that we are theologically diverse and we are politically diverse as well. A UU saying is that we don't all have to think alike to love alike. While we are unapologetically progressive in our theology and our social issues, there is still a spectrum of political views. Some of you want financial policies that are more conservative. Some of you are way left of Vice President Harris and are disappointed in her positions on frack fracking or the massive death toll in Gaza. Some of you are ecstatic about her positions, or at least the momentum that she has, especially this week. But please don't forget we are a spectrum. Like the spiritual nourishment mini-series we ran in August, we're having a Hope in Anxious Times mini-series from now through the Sunday after Election Day. I'm not planning for that one <laughs> until that week. Together, we will explore concepts of faith that will help ground us. We know that elections affect many issues that give us anxiety, from climate change to reproductive justice to LGBTQ equity, gun violence, and so many more. But we are also carrying our own personal anxieties about our jobs, our families, our mental health, our physical health, and our rights. 
we are carrying so much and sometimes it feels like the anxiety could just sweep us away and carry us downstream like a hurricane perhaps. When I thought of this series, I knew that we needed it, but once I came to writing it, I wasn't quite sure where I was gonna find this hope thing. <laughs> and there is not one answer, there are just different ways to think about it while we are also holding all of these anxieties together. For today's sermon, I am turning to the prophetic voice of Rebecca Solnit. Anyone know Rebecca Solnit's work? Rebecca is an American writer, historian, and activist. She is the author of 20 books on feminism, Western and indigenous history, popular, po popular power, social change, and hope. Last spring, someone recommended her book, A Paradise Built in Hell, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster, as we were going through our own community crisis and I cannot get her concepts and her research and her messages out of my mind because they take me right back to how we took care of each other and bonded in hurricane times. In story after story from the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fires to the 1985 Mexico City earthquake to 9-11 in New York City, to Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, she researched how humans responded to disasters. And time and time again, she found that the boundaries between people disappeared and people did what they could to help their fellow humans without thought to personal cost. It brought out some of the very best in humanity. In these disasters, the structures that upheld a tiered structure in normal times fell apart. In disasters, the structures are too slow, the red tape is too abundant, and the systems for normal times aren't flexible enough to adapt to dramatic change. The bureaucratic framework is one of the worst things to have in disasters, Solnit says. They can't maneuver, they can't integrate, and they are inflexible. So out of the lack of that structure, we are forced to turn to our human proclivities. In her research, she found over and over that the prevalent human nature in disaster is resilient, resourceful, generous, empathic, and brave. Solnit reminds us that the word emergency comes from emerge or to rise out of. An emergency is a separation from the familiar, a sudden emergence into a new atmosphere, one that often demands that we rise to the occasion. Catastrophe comes from the Greek kata or down, and strifen or turning over. It means an upset of what is expected, and it was originally meant to mean a plot twist. The word disaster comes from the Latin compound or of dis, or away, without, and astro, which is star or planet, literally without a star. So in the plot twists of life, where we emerge into something new, we find what Solnit says, the constellations of solidarity, altruism, and improvisation. In all of these stories, there are remarkable tales of people exhibiting these traits in a way that Solnit boldly calls utopian. Utopia? in a disaster. Now she's not saying that the consequences of the disaster are not terrible, but the way that people band together has all of the characteristics of what people are looking for in a utopia society. The two most basic goals of social utopias are to eliminate deprivation, hunger, ignorance and homelessness, and to forge a society in which no one is an outsider, no one is alienated. 
she found those utopias in disaster. In all of these examples, those who had resources shared with those who did not. Those who had food fed people. Those who had skills used them. Those who had shelter offered it. It's tempting to ask why, if they did this during disasters, why didn't they do it before or after? One reason is that they were not focused on long-term plans. Giving away thousands of pounds of food is, of course, not profitable in a capitalistic society. The other reason is that these disasters made people proximate to each other. It was more difficult to not ease suffering when it was right in front of you, no matter what the divisions were between you. And since the normal systems were suspended and rendered almost useless, so all the people adapted and rose to the occasion. Disasters force us to live in the now, right now, on the immediate moment-to-moment, day-to-day needs within the present reality, not the past or the future. Solnit made some fascinating comments around faith communities and how we respond, thinking about this model. She says that, quote, most religions turn their adherence toward the things we are afraid to face. Mortality, death, illness, loss, uncertainty, suffering, to the ways that life is always something of a disaster. It's one of the few places we can do that. Thus, Religion can be regarded as disaster preparedness, equipment not only to survive, but to do so with equanimity and to respond with calmness and altruism to the tragedies of everyday life. Many religions' practices also emphasize the importance of recognizing the connectedness of all things and the deep ties that we have from the congregation to all beings everywhere. In so doing, our communities inculcate as everyday practice the mutual aid and altruism that disaster sometimes delivers." End quote. So I would contend that we are in a slow disaster right now that the social structures that were set up to protect and help are not working. They are giving the powerful more power and making it harder and harder for the poor to get their basic needs met. The order from the forces like police and military benefit those with power and disproportionately oppress those without it. And the more that the people call that out, the more they want to impose order over us. I think that this is one aspect of what we're seeing with the pull of leaders from Trump to Hungary's Orban to Russia's Putin and the rise of authoritarian candidates around the world, not just here. We're seeing it in climate change. Our structures can't even agree that it exists, much less be flexible enough to adjust to it. And let's admit it, it is the hierarchy of corporations and the power of the rich that are continuing to push reliance on fossil fuels that are slowly killing us. The structure is not working. Our hope I believe, is not in our structures. Instead, the power has always been in our hands. Yes, I'm not saying things can't get worse if our elections give us leaders who are not working for our people. But so much of our government isn't working for the people anyways. And even if the elections turn out exactly as you personally want them to, the structures still may not be able to deliver what we need. We are in an emergency and that we are emerging into a new world. 
in the catastrophes of climate change and racism and poverty and bigotry, we are planning for a plot change. And in the disasters around us, we are turning to our community stars. This UUCP community has seen more than its fair share of emergencies and crises, as Shelley and Bunny mentioned, from the pandemic to the number of deaths we've experienced, to the trauma of misconduct, to the attacks of those who wish to harass us for our views, which, by the way, in every single case of all of those, we have turned to each other. In the instances of the right-wing harassments that we had, the systems of police and law have not helped us one single time, even though we've gone through all of the appropriate motions. But we have learned how to take care of ourselves. We have flocked together to empower ourselves to take care of each other. We have taken the power into our own hands. Yes, the election is important, but it is not everything. We must do what we believe and what we're capable of to change our structures, but this election won't come close to fixing all of our systemic problems. While we work on the system, and we must, we must also work on what is closer to home and that which we have more control over, our care for our people in the circles around us. We can't outsource all of this work to some outside government. We can create the society we want right here. And I don't believe this is an optional exercise. We need to learn mutual aid, interdependence, flexibility, how to lift our fellow humans to survive the individual and collective disasters, our own hurricanes, if you will, that we may encounter in our lives. We are in an emergency in that we are emerging into a new world. In the catastrophes, we are planning for a plot change. And in the disasters, we are turning to new constellations of community and care and interdependence. We as humans are built for this. We have the power in our own hands to build our own utopia. We must, and I believe that we will. So might it be. Amen.